Hey fellow knitters, welcome to my color work series. In this video, I'm going to be talking about uh, tension with regard to floats uh, when doing fair isle knitting. So floats are, and you can see this on the back or the wrong side of your work, floats are those bars of yarn uh, that carry over that are not being used um, during the spacing of those stitches. And that's, that's, the, that's why it's called stranded knitting because they form strands on the back. Um, what I'm going to talk about in this video is tension because uh, tension is very important when fair isle knitting so that your work um, appears flat and it's not bunched up or it doesn't have um, rails in it um, or ruts. And typically the, re the reason that happens um, is number one because of tension. Now when we talk about carrying floats, uh, classic fair isle is where you uh, you don't have floats that are longer than five stitches or, or that are greater than five stitches long. So what that means is as you're knitting along, if you've gone five stitches without using a particular working yarn, you have to catch that float at that interval. And there's a variety of reasons why. Number one is uh, if you're making a garment or a hat or something like that, um, if the float is larger or longer than five stitches, it's easy to catch it and snag it and then it will actually scrunch your work up. Um, if you do that. So that's that's essentially where that comes from. Um, you can do floats um, shorter uh, than uh, five stitches long. You can do um, three stitches. Some, you know, some people do three stitches or um, uh, every four stitches. That's fine. But typically once you reach that five stitch mark, you don't want to go um, past that because again, you run into problems of snagging. Um, the other issue that arises with using uh, floats greater than five stitches are tension issues and uh, that can actually uh, distort the appearance of your work. So in this video I'm going to uh, give you a couple of tips on how to keep your tension even um, as well as kind of spacing out or making adjustments for tension as you knit. So uh, trick I'll show you. Now the very first thing that I want to talk about is when you're actually knitting along you don't want to have your work scrunched up like this on your right needle because what you're doing is you are already creating tension problems because you're actually um, creating a float that is bunching these up and then as you knit down your work does appear scrunched up um, or you have tension issues. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to keep my stitches on my right side spaced out naturally and then as I knit if you notice as I'm completing the stitch, I'm actually stretching my work. And that is one trick that I use consistently to keep my floats all even. And the other thing that this does is all of the floats or the, the stitches below, when you stretch your work as you're going around, you're actually doing a manual adjustment of all, every single float. So as you're going along, you're kind of doing this. Um, which is typically what you would do um, to correct tension. However, um, you would eventually get to a point where um, that you'd have a, a bunch in your work like that. So when you keep your tension even as you knit, you don't have that problem. And then the act of stretching like this keeps your work um, even. So then again, is this, because the stitches naturally do tend to bunch up in your hand because the act of holding the needle stops them from actually going past your pinky on your right side. So that's why you like to stop every so often and spread them down around uh, the nylon portion of your needle. Now, the second tip I wanted to give you, uh, tell you all is what happens if the uh, the number of stitches before you switch colors again is greater than five. Well, we have to trap the float in that case. But then the question arises, well, I notice in my work as I'm trapping my float, um, I'm getting uh, or there's I'm forming a rut in my work. And that's where you can see definitive parallel um, indentations going down the face of your work. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. Um, number one is, is tension, obviously. But when you trap a float, what you're doing is you're creating tension on the stitch in which it's it's trapped. 
And that very tension is what kind of pulls the work down or puckers it at that point, which then if you're if you're doing it along the same um, row like that, you most definitely will have a rut in your work. So one way is to vary um, uh, where you catch your float. So if, for example, I caught my float here in this stitch on the previous round and I have to catch a float, well, I might catch the float on this stitch here. So you're varying uh, where you're actually ca uh, catching the float. So that's one method. The other method that I, that I actually prefer is let's say I, I get to a portion of my pattern where I have to do seven stitches in one color before switching back to the other color. Well, that's two stitches greater than the, the, the five stitch rule, but to not have to worry about, well, when did I catch the float on the previous row or where did I catch it? So I make sure not to, to catch it at that same point again, is I do the every other stitch uh, catch a float method. And what that is, is that's where you actually catch the float. So that's stitch one, stitch two, where you don't catch a float, stitch three, stitch four, stitch five, stitch six, stitch seven. So you're doing the every other catch a float method and then you switch colors, okay? And what that does is it evenly distributes the tension across that entire row of, of stitches. And so as you go along, um, you won't have, you won't see a specific rut in the area. And the other thing too, is when you come around in the second pass and let's say now you have to go nine stitches before you do the next color. When you do that every other stitch method, you are actually automatically placing that where you catch the float in between the two stitches below where you did. And so that's what's great about it. So again, it evenly distributes that tension down your work. And so you don't notice, you don't have a noticeable um, rut in your work. And I'll show you here, this is what I did here. So if you notice um, right here, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stitches. And so what I actually did was the every other um, float method or, you know, catch the float. And I actually did it on the even stitches. So I did knit one, and then for the second one, knit two, I caught the float there, knitted one right there, that's three, and then for stitch four, caught the float, five, caught the float on six, seven, and then switched colors. And then of course, the row directly above it is only five stitches long, so I didn't have to do the every other, uh, other method. You could if you want, um, you, you most certainly could do that uh, even for five stitches if you prefer catching your floats um, sooner than a five stitch uh, range like that. But again, as you see, it, it eliminates the ruts, you know, any, any sort of ruts that would, like if you did it here, and then of course it's mirrored up here. But if you were doing that for every single stitch across here because you had a design that was greater than five stitches, you would most definitely have a rut. Um, even if you're, if you have, if you give it enough slack, um, it still has it because it's, it's bulk. It, that's what actually creates the distortion is the bulk of the stitch itself along with the, um, the float. A few uh, tension tips that I had. Uh, glad, thank you for watching the video, by the way, and please do subscribe to my channel. I do have several videos out there. Like I said, this is part of the color work series. Uh, also please do provide comments and feedback. I, I do appreciate those. Um, oftentimes I, I actually learn, learn stuff from you guys, uh, things that I'm, I'm not aware of. So uh, by all means, do provide them. And again, thank you for watching.